relationship. My friends, our second text for today comes from Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. And like Bill, I will be reading also from the New Revised Standard Version. So please, my friends, listen and read along. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as children. And because you are children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. Amen. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you today for your blessings and all that you have done. And for this time, this time of the year, where we stand at the conclusion of one and at the beginning of another, we thank you for 2017 and all that has come and all that has taken place. Even in those difficult moments, we recognize and realize that you were there all along. Your hand has always been there. And we thank you. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your support. We thank you, Lord, for being patient with us as we do our best to serve you. Now, we thank you for all that we've witnessed. We pray that you're using these things to prepare us to hear a word from you, so right now, make me less. Allow me to decrease so that you can increase and become more and fix us by clearing our minds and opening our hearts and unstopping our ears so we can hear from you. And upon hearing from you, we want to leave this place better than the way we arrived. Yes. Yes, Lord, we want to walk out of here better than the way we walked in. Through Christ, we ask it all. Amen and amen. If you would, please, my friends, on this last Sunday of 2017, turn to a neighbor, look at them good, and repeat after me. Friend, today's sermon is called, I'm an heir. Amen. I'm, <laughs> I'm an heir. You, you know, I've yet to receive the phone call that my extremely wealthy great aunt has died and left all of her wealth to me. Haven't gotten that phone call yet. Matter of fact, I don't know if I've got a great aunt that would fit the category. But nevertheless, I can dream, can I? I can dream. I will be the only heir to her vast fortune. And as this heir, this person who inherits, this person who is entitled to inherit whatever she would have, property, possessions, whatever it would be, it would be in my trust be placed under my name, if you will. Well, that's a dream. That's a dream. But here's the understanding that comes behind it. You see, usually for an individual who is an heir to actually receive what is being promised, the person who has the possessions must be dead. That's how you get it. They die, you get a phone call, you show up, lawyers get you to sign some papers, and then you receive. But according to our text, our Semitic text for today, we're already heirs, and we're heirs who have already received. 
In your spare time, my friends, I would encourage you to go back to Galatians and read chapters 3 through 5. Gives you a great background to what we're working with on today. You see, Paul and his co-laborers, they founded the Galatian church and they taught the persons there in the church, the members there. They taught them basic Christian principles that they believed would help to strengthen them on this Christian journey. But they had to go. Paul and those working with Paul, they had to leave. And when they left, another group showed up. A group of Jewish Christians, basically, they showed up and they basically told the Galatians, everything Paul taught you was okay, but it wasn't complete. Paul left out some very important pieces for each of you. And they told the Galatians that they must obey the law in order to be authentic members of the body of Christ. You see, Galatians, there's a whole bunch of rules, regulations, some restrictions that you guys don't know about. Paul didn't tell you about this stuff, but we're here to make sure that you do know these things. And if you follow them, then you'll be a part of the body of Christ, basically stating that believing in the sacrificial death of Jesus and his resurrection Accepting Jesus the Christ as your Lord and Savior wasn't enough. It's on the way. <laughs> but it's not enough. The man had to be circumcised. The people had to follow all of the Jewish laws and customs and all of their special days. And one of the things that makes this troubling is that many of the Galatians were not of Jewish descent. Well, most of them were not of Jewish descent. Jewish laws and customs, they were taught to Jewish children early in life so that they would grow up knowing them. Just like your mama taught you how to make your bed early in life. And many of us at this particular point we just know how to do it because we grew up doing it. You know, some have stated that the laws, the Jewish laws, totaled more than 70 in addition to the original Ten Commandments. And the Galatians had not heard of these laws, and many were believing that they had to follow them in order to be a Christian. They'd forgotten what Paul had said. They listened to what the newcomers were saying and began to fall away from the faith. Some would leave altogether. Some would change how they were serving the Lord in order to please these new folks who came in. Well, when you read chapters 3 through 5, and if you read the entire letter, to the Christians in Galatia. You'll find that Paul is very frustrated. It shows his frustrations and his angst towards the Galatians. Paul calls them foolish for listening to these outsiders. He says some of them have left the true gospel for another gospel that really is not a gospel at all. Paul says that he wishes that he was there. This is my favorite one. He says, I wish I was there so I could change my tone with you. Now, for me, that's my mama talking. I hear mama in the back of my head. So if, if I change my tone and you hear my tone, you know what I mean. And this is what Paul is saying. You may not get how upset I am by just looking at the words on the page. If I was there, I could show you exactly how upset I am. Paul and his team had spiritually invested much in the Galatians only to lose some to false teaching. And Paul believed that they were stronger than that. 
Paul believed they were better than this. Well, we can understand this, can't we? Can't we understand Paul's frustrations? Just think about it. You spent all that time and all of that money sending your child to science camp, believing that your child would be the one who would discover a cure for cancer, the one who would discover, make some great discovery that would quantum leap humanity into the future. Spend all of your time and all of your money sending this child to science camp summer after summer after summer for him to drop out of school and start a band in your garage. We can understand Paul's feelings, can't we? I mean, you took all of that time to establish a nonprofit organization to supply goods for the needy, only to find out that some of the folks on your team have taken those goods and they're just actually selling them. We can understand Paul's frustrations, can't we? I mean, 20 years you've been married to this person, had children with this person, just to find out that your spouse has another person and another family on the other side of town. Oh, yeah, there'll be some frustrations and some angst, probably some furniture moving, <laughs> if all of this were to take place. And as upset as he is, Paul takes some time, however, to explain the law's purpose in order to remind them of the power of faith that they have in Jesus. You see, the Ten Commandments and many of the laws added, they served as a guide for righteous living, but as a harsh guide for righteous living. The longer we lived under these laws, the more obvious it was that we could not keep them. We couldn't obey them. One understanding is that if you broke one commandment, you actually were guilty of breaking all of them. So Jesus Christ comes into the world to take on the ultimate penalty for sin, the ultimate penalty for not being able to keep the law. He was born of a virgin during the time of the law, so he understood the law. He knew the law. He lived under the law. But he died, my friends, to redeem us from this ultimate penalty of the law. Eternal death and separation from God. That's why he died. To keep that from happening to us. Now what we have in our text is this promise this promise that the Lord has blessed us with. And the Lord made a promise to Abraham that would be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Abraham's descendants, the promise would say, Abraham's descendants would be a number as great as the sands on a seashore. Abraham, your descendants would be so large that they would be a number as great as the stars in the sky. And they would all be blessed by God because of the covenant God made with Abraham. Now, unrelated to this text, there was another promise that was made to King David. And that promise was that David would have a descendant who would sit on a throne, on the throne, whose kingdom would never end. The blessing of Abraham's people would eventually be carried out through Jesus the Christ, who died for all people. And when you read those chapters, you will see in Galatians 3 and 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for all are one in Jesus Christ. This same Jesus would be the son of David whose kingdom would reign forever. You see, with the law, this promise of blessing could only be understood if we kept it. 
You get the promise if you keep the law. And we couldn't keep the law. We didn't keep the law. But praise be the name of the Lord. You see, the promise meant so much to God that the only way to obtain it was given through Jesus Christ. Galatians 3 and 29 states, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Oh, hello, somebody. We have the promise and we are heirs because of this. Listen, do you know, do you know why Jesus was born? You know why he was born? Listen, Jesus was not born just for a chorus of angels to come and give a concert. Jesus wasn't born just for the shepherds to leave their flocks by night and journey into Bethlehem. Jesus wasn't born just for magi to make a pilgrimage. No. Jesus wasn't born just for Simeon and Anna to see him before they died. Jesus wasn't born for Mary to have stories to ponder in her heart or for Joseph to gain an apprentice. No. Jesus wasn't born just to walk on water, just to turn water into wine. Jesus wasn't born just to calm raging seas or to give sight to the blind or to raise the dead or to feed 5,000 plus folks and 4,000 plus folks. No, Jesus was born to make sure all of the heirs of the promise got to cash in on time. All of the heirs. Hallelujah, <laughs> of which I'm one, and so are you. And this promise is multifaceted and multilayered. This promise is to never leave me or forsake me. This promise is to supply all of my needs. This promise is to empower me to let my light shine before folks. This promise is to love me unconditionally. This promise is that death will not be the end for us. This promise is that there's a place that has been prepared for us. That where the Lord is, we will be also. This promise is not to be abused, my friends, but we are entitled to it because Jesus has made us so. And the beauty about this promise, Jesus died for us. So I've inherited it. I'm living it right now, and I will continue to live it in the life hereafter. We're heirs. We're heirs. So be blessed today as we close out this year and look at 2018. Go into 2018 knowing the truth. You're loaded. Amen. <laughs>